Uh, good evening, friends. It's an absolute joy to be with you tonight. Um, my heart is full to be in this room with expectation for what God wants to do. And in order to raise our expectation, I'm going to ask you to do something uncomfortable. I'm going to give you one minute. I'm going to time it. You have to find another seat, and it's got to be at least five meters away from the one you're sitting on right now. So one minute. Here we go. Find another seat quickly. The people in the front row, you're not allowed to stay there. You've got to find another seat. There we go. I'm checking the room and making sure that this is happening. Say hi to whoever you are passing by. Make sure that everyone moves. Guys, there's some front row seats here that's been occupied this whole time. So if you want it, now is your opportunity. <laughs> that's great. You guys have got 20 seconds. Find a seat. Great. Five seconds. If you're still walking around, you've got two more seconds. Two, one, and sit down. Wonderful. I want to just take a moment to honor the campus team, the, the South Africa team, for an incredible conference. So I hear when I arrived here earlier today of what God is doing. Can we give them a cheer for their hard work? I know that a lot is seen and felt up front, but there's a lot that goes in behind the scenes that you guys don't know about. And it's just a joy to walk into this space and know that God has prepared the ground here tonight for the word to go out so that people's lives can be changed, not in here, but out there, because that is what he has called us to. Now, I've got to ask an honest question. We are in church, so you're not, you're not allowed to lie. Okay, you've got to raise your hand if this is true of you. Who completely disliked having to move around a minute ago. Complete, you just, I like why, I like my seat. Like why, like why are we doing this? Who disliked when we had to look each other in the face and tell each other things that were awkward? Anyone else in there? Who disliked the fact that you missed some important sport this afternoon because you're here? Great, who disliked that you might feel hungry now and you actually want something to eat but you're still here in this room? Who disliked that you have got to face some rain on your way back and it's traffic and I spoke to someone earlier today I won't reveal their name but they dislike driving around in Cape Town because they say the people in Cape Town cannot drive the problem with us is that we have got so many conditions that we want to just be okay in order for us to feel like we are okay and this evening I'm going to speak to us about unconditional abiding unconditional abiding because in a moment once we're done here tonight you're going to leave this room and when you step outside you're going to be faced with a whole lot of conditions that you might not prefer you see it's easy to abide inside the room when the band is playing and we are all together and when we're feeling fuzzy and we're praying for one another and we're looking each other in the face and telling each other we are talented and we've got authority but once we step out of this room, we are in a new space, new conditions, and in a moment, our abiding can cease. But I believe as we go to Scripture today that God wants to invite you into a place where there is unconditional abiding. And I believe it's completely possible. So let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead our hearts tonight as we look into His Word. Thank you, Lord, for your word that is full of examples for us to align to. Thank you, Lord, for this word that we have just received, that we need to walk in the talents and the gifts and the call that you have given us, Lord, and not be swayed, but be ready in and out of season. And I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that as we come to the end of these two days of gathering together, abiding together, that you will set our lives on a course that we can know there is continual awareness of you that's available for us in our abiding. I pray, Lord, that if there's one thing that we leave with here today is that we would leave with the words of Jesus saying, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations and I will be with you until the end that we would leave you knowing, Lord, that your abiding presence is ever there and ever giving. I pray, Lord, that if any of us need to bring to your cross tonight any conditions that we have put up to say that we are abiding well, 
that we would lay them down, Jesus, and we know that the only condition to abide is what you have done on the cross for us. All we've got to do is accept it and live in it. And we ask for that in Jesus' name. And we all say, amen. This is something that happened in my own life a couple of years back when I needed to prepare a sermon. And I wanted all the conditions to be perfect. It's one of those mornings that you get up and you're like, you prepare the lunch boxes for school, you make sure that uh, the wife is happy, you make sure that there's no meetings planned for the day, you put your phone on flight mode, you go down to your favorite Seattle, you get that latte that you like, you've got the right Maverick music uh, in your ears. Everything is just perfect for me to abide and be the sermon prep man that I need to be in order to preach the message that I need to preach on Sunday morning. And it was in that moment that the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Pierre, do you really need all these things and all these conditions to connect with me? And I wondered about that because it seems like that is the notion of the day for us. Because the world is constantly throwing things at us. We try to create this space and these spaces for us to be absolutely perfect so that we can now say, yes, I have been and I am in the presence of God. Is that not limiting God in a way? Is that not, not disallowing him to be God? By us saying, I'm going to craft this condition and this space that I want that is absolutely perfect. I want to tell you a story about John Wesley. When I say the name, some of you might know, some of you might not, but one of the greatest preachers, scholars of the word, teachers of the word, but he started out as a clergyman who later on in his life realized that he's never been converted. And his story goes like this, that once he was ordained as a priest in the Church of England, and he's been ministering on the pulpit for such a long time, he got invited to go on a transatlantic trip to America, and he ends up on a ship with the Moravians. Now, if you know anything about the Moravians, they were a unique group of people from the area in Germany coming together who were deeply devoted to Jesus, and they were taking the gospel to their world out of this community of living together, abiding together in the presence of God. And they were on the ship with John Wesley. And being on the ship, specifically on January the 25th, 1736, John Wesley and whoever else was on the ship from England all the way to America and the Moravians entered into one of the biggest storms that you can imagine you can face. And John Wesley wrote this in hindsight of the story, he said, all the Englishmen were screaming. That's an interesting picture. I might be singing ole ole because they're watching the football game, but I can't imagine Englishmen all going around screaming. They're usually quite reserved and diplomatic. But he said, all the Englishmen were screaming, but the Germans were sitting quietly singing praises to God. And I went to them afterwards and said, what is it that you have that I don't? Because even your women and your children we're unafraid. And they simply responded, we're not afraid to die. And for two years, being around these people, investigating their lives, being on mission, going back to their, their place where they gather, he's been in this turmoil because he saw a people that could abide in any condition of life. And then on May 25th, two years later, he had a moment where he said, something changed for me when I felt the presence of Jesus, and I call that my conversion. A man who's been trained in the word, who's been preaching the word, who has never learned to abide. And it took people who could abide in the worst of conditions to show him something that he has been missing all along. What could our nation look like if all of you guys go out there and abide with Jesus in a way that even though the economy is crashing, people would say, are you not afraid? And we would say, we're not afraid to die because we are like those 10 virgins ready for our bridegroom to come. We will remain faithful in our beliefs. Now I want to take us to, I think, the master of the one in, a, in the Bible and biblical stories who knew how to abide continually and unconditionally, and that is the man Paul. So if you would please turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 16, we we're going to go through a story of Paul's life in a moment. 
We're going to be reading from verse 23, but I want to quickly paint the story before we get into the reading. Paul has received a Macedonian call. And I believe he's been a man who's been unconditionally abiding. We're going to see it in the story. And because of that, he received the call that God had for him. So he goes on his mission trip, and then he gets to the, the, the city of Philippi, and there he plants the very first church in Europe. Isn't that exciting? The first church in Europe is being planted. He got together with some people. He led a woman to Jesus by preaching the gospel by the name of Lydia. And then, as it was the custom of the Hebrew people, they would go to prayer meetings every day. And as they were going to the prayer meetings daily, there was a slave girl, a young girl who was enslaved by some masters who had a spirit of divination. She was demon-possessed, and she could discern things. And every day as they were going to pray, she would follow Paul and Silas on the way to prayer, and she would cry out, these are the men of the Most High God. This is quite interesting. Because maybe in that moment for Paul and Silas, there might have been a slight temptation to walk around the street saying, yeah, that's right. We are godly men. We are those of the most high God. But an abiding man has no need for the world to proclaim his accolades. And a couple times later, when this happened again, it says, Paul got annoyed. <laughs> so he turned around and he told the demon to leave the girl. And she got set free. I love how the story starts. He goes to a new place and the first convert is a woman, which in that time was sidelined. And the first person that said being set free from the devil is a slave girl, which in that time would have been massively sidelined, oppressed and abused. Because that's how God wants to build his church. He wants to build it not just with the strong and the elite. He wants to build it with those that haven't been considered of any worth up until this point. So he sets the slave girl free by driving out the demon. And then the owners got upset. Because all of, them, all of a sudden their money is up for grabs. Because they've been making business out of this woman. They eventually take it to the magistrates, the leaders of the city, and I love this part. It said, the entire city got upset by what has happened. Isn't that what we call to, go, to do, guys? To go into our cities and upset the status quo? To walk into the streets of our campuses and do life in such a way that people would have to have meetings and say, Ish, what is it with these guys? They upset our city. They carried the kingdom into this place. And the people got upset. And then the magistrates ordered Paul and Silas to be beaten. And it said, and all the crowds joined in in beating them down. Now let's read from verse 23 up to 34 together. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword, and he was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and his whole family. Then he brought them up into his house and he set before them food. And he rejoiced along with the entire household that he had believed in God. Isn't that an amazing story? Let's go through this quickly. If I ask you to turn to your friend right now and give them a big shot in the face, this meeting is going to end, right? Because we will all feel quite uncomfortable. 
and a lot of pain. But here Paul and Silas have been inflicted with blows from the Roman government and those soldiers that love violence. And not just that, the whole crowd joined in. If you get 10 massive blows to your body, your body is going to go into some kind of shock at some point. But they got 100. And not just that, they probably got ripped off their clothes. They were taken into the prison, but not just the prison, the inner prison, which is the darkest, dirtiest, coldest corner of the Roman prison where they leave people to die. And once they got in there, they said, it's not enough that they're just down there. Let's put them in stocks. Let's bind them up so that they cannot get out in any way. Stocks wasn't a very comfortable thing. I'm not talking about stockings, which is also not a very comfortable thing. So I hear, I've never tried it. <laughs> but it wasn't a very comfortable thing. And here they are with their bodies shaking, cold, naked, in the stocks, rats around, maybe some decaying bodies around. And I wonder at that point what the conversation in their minds might have been. Wow, God, you've called me, and now this? You've given me a vision to come to this region, and now this? You've given me only two converts, and now this? Maybe that's the conversation that we would be having with our own souls in that moment. But here Paul and Silas is in the worst of conditions, but they were still abiding. So they were laying on that floor or however they were positioned. Can you imagine Paul leaning in and saying, Silas, you awake? Paul saying, are you there, Silas? Dude, are you even still alive? <laughs> Silas said, yeah. You know what I've been praying been trying to just make sure my connection with God is good. And Paul says, He's never failed me yet. He's never failed me yet. My heart and my soul confess. God is my confidence. He's never failed me yet. Silas says, man, yes. And he starts singing and joining in. They started singing so loudly that from the inner prison, the rest of the prison could lean in and hear their singing. They could hear the hymns and the prayers going up to God. That is what it was for them to dwell and abide in God unconditionally. And then I look at that and I look at all my lame excuses and all my things that I want to position right to say, oof, I'm connecting with the Lord. I'm like, Jesus. Teach me this. Teach me how to abide there. But even though I nearly escaped death, I'm still singing. I'm still praying. I'm still praising. D.L. Moody said this, excuses are the cradle that Satan rocks men off to sleep in. Might be up there. Excuses are the cradle that Satan rocks men off to sleep in. What have been our excuses of late to disconnect from abiding in him? When he has paid the full price on the cross to give us the confidence to come to the throne room of grace continually and always to be led by the Spirit to live in that place of close community with Jesus. Yeah, but Pierre, you don't understand my circumstance. You don't know my story. Well, I know who does, and that's Jesus. And if he knew this story, he didn't expect anything less of them. What makes us think that he expects anything else of us? Remember, these guys weren't superhumans. They were normal human beings. They didn't come with a Marvel Comics ex extra strength to face all these blows. They were men like us. And out of this place of unconditional abiding, we see five profound things happen. Unconditional abiding leads to transformed plans. Unconditional abiding first leads to transformed plans. It was abiding that got them into the prison in the first place. 
Because out of abiding, we read the story a couple of verses before that they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So here Paul and Silas is trying to figure out, God, where are you calling us? And they're abiding and they're being with him. And the Holy Spirit says, oh, oh no, not there. You're not going to go that way. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Once again, because of abiding, he said, no, 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 not this way. And then the story continues. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Traus, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us here. Continual, unconditional abiding led Paul and Silas to be in Philippi, and to be in this prison that they found themselves in. It was abiding that gave them the ability to lead Lydia to Jesus. It was abiding that gave them the ability to discern this girl is shouting profanity. It is abiding that actually got them into prison. Are you okay if your life with Jesus is going to cost you all your comforts? Are you okay If your life of following Jesus and abiding with him is going to put you in places where it feels like prison. And are you okay that when you find yourself there to abide your way out of it again? It's abiding that got them into the fix and it is abiding that got them out of it. Secondly, unconditional abiding leads to transforming power. Here they are singing, and I know this because we are on this side of the story. I know this. They didn't say, you know what? Maybe if we sing, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies, something supernatural is going to happen, and stuff is going to break, and we're going to get out of here. (laughs) That's not why they sang. They sang because they loved Jesus. They sang because he was the one worthy of their lives. They sang because they wanted to be with him. And maybe for them, they thought this might be our last breath. So I'm going to use it singing and praising the one who's given breath to my lungs. But it was in that abiding that the ground was preparing for the power of God to come into their play. And here we are blessed to see the story because it teaches us when we abide like that, we can expect the power of God. And a transforming power that comes into the scene. All of a sudden, there was an earthquake, the Bible teaches. And when the earthquake happened, what happened? Immediately, all the bonds were unfastened. What I love about this story, it wasn't just Paul and Silas who got out of the prison. When the power of God comes to the prisons that we might find ourselves in, those who are in the prison with us gets to get set free as well. Because that's how God works when we abide in him. I love how this connects to the letter that Paul wrote later on to the Corinthians, where he says this, but he said to me, speaking about God speaking to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Are we living there, friends? Maybe we are losing out on perfect strength because we're not comfortable with weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. God has given them the call. They've seen some first fruits in this new place, the first church planted in Europe. They've experienced it. And then God said, remember where your power and your strength comes from. Maybe it was deeply personal for them. We don't know. They needed that reminder you see, everything in our world and our society is trying to get us away from weakness. It's trying to get us away from that place of being uncomfortable and where the conditions don't suit the life that we want. People are spending endless amounts on finding new gods and things that they worship to find the better self that they can become in this world. Where the way of Jesus is one of self-denial and becoming weak so that he can be strong. 
What would our world look like? What would your campus look like? What would your family look like? What would your city look like if you are okay to be supported by Jesus in your weakness rather than just to get out of it? And I'm not proclaiming here that you never should be set free from the brokenness that the world has placed on us because I believe that that's what God does. But he uses our weakness in a way that's foolish to this world to show that the strength that he gives us is far greater than that what man can ever do. And because of this transforming power, not just Paul and Silas, but every single prisoner in that prison got set free. Maybe our nation is just waiting for people to live here so that our nation can be set free from the prisons she is finding herself in. Maybe. Unconditional abiding is that key that we need and that you guys need as the next generation to live there, to see prisons being transformed by the power of God, which is my third point. There was a transformed prison. Your prison abiding becomes fruitful right at that point when others are set free. You know what I love about this story is that Paul and Silas got set free, but they didn't just make a run for it. If that was me, I would say, Silas, now we've now we got to make a run. Let's get out of here. Because they might just catch us and beat us down again. It's interesting that the jailer woke up and he saw that the things were open, but everyone was still inside the prison. They didn't make a run for it because Paul and Silas were abiding, they were confident that if Jesus could open up the prison, that he would walk them out of there safely. And then the jailer wanted to kill himself. He wanted to commit suicide. And Paul calls from inside the prison and says, don't do that. We are all still here. Maybe some of our friends out there are with us in the prisons that we find ourselves in in this society. But we've neglected to call out and say, don't go down the road of death in your confession, in what you say about your life, in what you say about your country, in what you say about your future, in what you say and believe about yourself. How powerful was it in a moment to see what it looks like that we actually believe that we are talented, that we can look each other in the face and say, believe that. So not only were the prisoners saved and transformed in this moment, but even those who put them in prison. The jailer himself got a ticket to salvation. Paul's life is full of this when you read his letters, the words, in Christ. In Christ. Before he was in prison, he was in Christ. When he was in prison, he was in Christ in prison, when we find ourselves in a difficult relational space, we are first in Christ before we are in a difficult relational space. And the world is doing a great thing in identity wars to say, before I'm a Christian, I am this and a Christian. But we've got to flip the script back to the way that God wants us and say, before I'm anything else or anywhere else, I am in Christ. And because of that in Christ position, that Paul had, he could go to prison, not just this time, but time and time again, and he could see fruitfulness. Because he writes this to the same church that he planted on this mission trip in the letter to the church in Philippians. He says this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to the advance of the gospel, so that, so that it has become known throughout the world, whole imperial God, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Years later, when he writes a letter to them, he says, I am once again in prison, but I want you to know that I'm in Christ. And because I'm in Christ, in prison, the whole imperial God, all of the Roman God, all of those soldiers have heard the gospel, which is a great thing. It's a good thing. And not just that. The gospel is spreading because of my position. Again, are we comfortable to be in uncomfortable spaces and remain abiding because there's gospel fruit that comes out of it? 
Because in this moment back in Acts chapter 16, when this prison guard wanted to kill himself, and Paul and Silas rushed out and said, don't do it. He turned around and he said, what must I do to be saved? Unconditional abiding begs the question in those who's unsaved, please show me the way. Which leads me to my next point, transformation, transforming proclamation. It wasn't just enough for Paul and Silas to experience the power of God for themselves. They needed to follow on with the preaching of the gospel. And perhaps the world is waiting for a church that would not just hog the power of God for ourselves. Go to a conference, go to a service, want to get prayed for again, want to get a prophetic word again, want to experience healing again, want to see a sign and wonder and miracle again, while the outside world is waiting for people who's willing to abide in dark spaces with Christ and let the power of God come there so that they can say, I need that. Can we take the power of God to the outside? And not just wait for the perfect condition when the band plays a song that you so love. And ooh, now the Spirit is showing up as He has ever left. He's never left, guys. Continual abiding makes us realize that He's never left. He doesn't give us 10% here and oof, that singer is anointed, now 40%. Okay, wow, now the band is going for it. Give them 80, guys, as if he's playing this game with us. No, he's waiting for hearts to say, I am abiding. Doesn't matter what happens around me. Doesn't matter what song is being played. Doesn't matter how I feel because my feelings are fleeting. And the Bible said that a man's heart will lead him astray. So God, I'm not going to act on feelings. I'm going to act on faith, knowing that you are here, present in this moment. And I'm not going to determine your presence by a presence meter by saying, if the goosebumps are high, your presence is high. And if the goosebumps are low, man, that wasn't the greatest Sunday service I've had. Because we were never made just for the Sunday service. We were made to take the transformational power power of Jesus to the world. And when that power comes, we cannot let, just let it be. We then come with the transforming proclamation of the gospel. Because I go back to the very reason that Paul and Silas found themselves here. In the early verses of Acts chapter 16, when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. We're not just going to plant a church. We're not just going to say yes to the call. We're not just going to be there and be beaten up and experience some great power. We're not just going there to find some Christians that we like hanging out with. We are going there to preach the gospel because the gospel and the gospel alone is the good news that God became man in Jesus Christ. He lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died in our place, proving after he was resurrected, that he is the Son of God, offering salvation and forgiveness of sin to anyone who would repent and believe in him. That's the message we go out with. And unconditional abiding takes us through the thread of our weakness and our pain to get to a place where God has worked so much in us that when our mouth opens and we're surrounded by those saying, what do I need to do to be saved? We proclaim the gospel to them. We don't just get into another debate about culture and society and ideas and sexuality. We preach the gospel. Can we become confident in the gospel again? It is the only power of God to save. It's that message. And you know what? Let's take the anxiety out of it because Jesus was pretty non-anxious in all of what he did. You just preach the gospel and you've done what you need to do. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts, and it's the Father that draws. So when you preach the gospel, you are partnering with the one who created the world and created that person hearing that message. So all you need to do is proclaim the gospel and let God, the Father, draw. Let the Holy Spirit convict and let them meet Jesus. Can we make sure that we make the proclamation of the gospel our greatest pursuit in this world again? Then we will see prisons transformed. 
then we will know that the power of God wasn't just for us to have a great moment. And believe me, I love those moments. But it's so that we can take the message of salvation to the world. And then, I love this part, moves all the way from a transforming power to a transformed prison to the proclamation of the gospel, which is the only transforming essence to this point. We see a complete transformed people. All of society changes when we abide unconditionally. The woman Lydia, the first believer, the slave girl, the elite Roman jailer, and apparently jailers were guys who were retired as veterans in the army. But they would have been trustworthy men who have led armies before. They were the ones who were given the right to take care of the prisons. All of society is experiencing this transformation. But not just them. The story continues. They preach the gospel to him. And he says, today salvation will come to you and your household. And this man takes them to his house. And in his house, they continue the story of preaching the gospel. And what do they do? They baptize him. And after they've baptized him, I love the story, the man sets a meal in front of him, the very prisoner who probably gave them the last kick and beat over the head as they walked into the inner prison is now cooking them food. And then, this is true transformation. He leaned in and he washed their wounds. When we abide unconditionally, this is what will take place. We will move from wounding to wound washing and from being beaten up to baptizing. The one who wounded was the one who said, let me clean that up for you. Isn't that what our nation needs? The one who got beaten up, I'm going to show Jesus to you. And I'm going to baptize you in the water. And when you come out of that water, my friend, you are a new creation. Whatever's been done has been done. I'm not holding you accountable for that anymore. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and your own family members aren't saved because you're just holding them accountable to whatever it is that you're doing. And maybe rightfully so, you've been in incredible pain because of what they've done. But with a heart like Paul and Silas who's abiding unconditionally, there might be this moment where God's power comes and you could look at them through the eyes of Jesus saying that they can be a new creation where the old life has gone and the new has come being baptized in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that that's possible? That the wounded will experience their wounds being washed by the ones who wounded them? And that those who were beaten up will experience the power of God because they're taking the gospel to their offenders, to the ones that oppressed them, to the ones that broke them down. Unconditional abiding, my friends, I believe is the message that I want to leave you with tonight. And if you go out here, you've got a choice to make. You've got a choice to make when you go to bed tonight, tomorrow morning when you wake up, if and when you go to church. Maybe someone's not greeting you at church and get offended. Are we so quick to offend these days? Someone gives you a skewed look and you're like, what was that all about? Becomes a little side hustle with your friends. Oh, did you see how she looked at me? Someone gets a little bit more praise for something they've done and you thought, I deserve that. Do we deserve anything? We do. We deserve death. But because of Jesus Christ, we have grace and life. So unconditional abiding. Man, I look across this room and I'm like, if you guys can do that, if you guys can just do that, then those talents that Roger spoke about will happen. You don't have to go find them. They will happen. Then those things that you're believing for will take place. 
then you might find yourself in prison and you might even be there for a whole long time. But like Paul, you can say, I'm in Christ. And when I'm in him and I'm abiding in him, doesn't matter where I find myself. Doesn't matter if my bank balance looks crazy. Doesn't matter if I don't have a car. Doesn't matter if my family doesn't like me that much. Doesn't matter if my friends disowned me. It doesn't matter if life is really hot right now. Doesn't matter whether I get sick. Doesn't matter any of these things because I am in Christ and him and I are one and we are abiding and we are loving one another and we are intimate. And when I wake up in the morning, I think about Jesus. And when I go to bed at night, I think about Jesus. And I walk through the day, I'm in communion with Jesus because he paid a high price for this life and this relationship and when I spend time with my family I'm not there to just spend time with them I'm spending time with Jesus and them and I walk through this journey when I study and things are hard and I maybe have a fail you know what it's okay because I have Jesus I am in Christ in all circumstances come on guys let's live there let's live there if that's your desire tonight and I don't want you to just get up because you have to You've already gotten up a little while back. I know how this goes. In fact, this is what I want you to do. If that's your desire, I want you to kneel tonight. Get a little uncomfortable for a moment. Say, Jesus, yes, I have all the reasons to complain. I have all the reasons to not want to abide. Maybe just bring those reasons to him. Maybe those conditions that has made it hard lately. Lay it at his feet. But take a moment to wait on him. We've got a few minutes to do that before we do anything else. The band's not going to sing a song. We're not going to pray for you now. We're not going to try and create the perfect condition for you to abide. It's as simple as this, James 4 verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Jesus, I just ask, as your sons and daughters abide right now, just meet them. Set them free from the prisons they might be in. Speak to them about the message that they've got to preach. Show them who in their world needs to hear that message. Whatever it is that you want to do by your spirit, come and do it because you can.